Hello again everyone, I'm Jamie and welcome back to Trick Bricks. Today we're taking another step in our Epic Adventures retrospective series with a close look at set number 5948, The Desert Expedition. Released in 1998 and retailing for $20, this will be the largest adventure set we've reviewed so far, coming in at 196 pieces and including four characters and one skeleton minifigure. And, to be honest, this set can be a bit confusing for collectors. It was actually released under two different names and three different set numbers. From what I can gather, the regular retail release was known as Desert Expedition. But there was also a version that included this handy storage container. That set was 5909 Treasure Raiders. And just for good measure, the model number 2879 was also assigned to the Desert Expedition. Strictly speaking, they were all identical sets as far as the pieces went, the only difference being this guy. We'll take a closer look at him in a future episode. I don't have the original box, but even worse, the original instructions are long gone. But if you ever find yourself in the same boat, all of the adventures instructions are available in downloadable PDF form directly from LEGO's website, which can be a lifesaver. In the interest of time, and since we have so much ground to cover, we're going to forgo the speed build today and get straight to the review. But if you're curious as to how the Desert Expedition goes together, a dedicated speed build episode is also available for your viewing pleasure. But for now, thanks to the marvels of film editing, we're ready to jump right in. This set is like a ready-made adventure. You've got a small campsite, some Egyptian relics, two vehicles, and most importantly, you have two bad guys and two heroes. So let's give them a closer look. We're gonna go ahead and give the baddies the spotlight first, beginning with the main antagonist of the story, the evil lord Sam Sinister. If his name doesn't give it away, his head-to-toe black getup should clue everyone in that he's not messing around. He's topped off with, appropriately, a top hat, and his face print features arched eyebrows, some wire-rimmed spectacles, and a perfectly devilish goatee. And he's smiling at us, which is a bit unnerving. His torso depicts a black suit jacket with red collared shirt, and simple black pants finish off his outfit. It's clear to me that Sam Sinister is a bad guy's bad guy, the quintessential mustache twirling villain. And in our last episode, we took a close look at his second in command, the hook handed Baron von Baron. But this time, instead of an aviator's cap, Baron is wearing his more common white pith helmet. Everything else is identical, so if you're interested in seeing more of him, check out episode 3 of our series, The Bywing Baron. Now that we've got those two goons out of the way, let's check in with our adventurers. First, the brains behind every quest they set out on is Dr. Charles Lightning. Starting at the top, he's wearing the same pith helmet as Baron Von Baron, and his face print is full of character. Just looking at this, I can tell that Dr. Lightning is the type of person who can decipher ancient texts and hieroglyphics instantly, but can't remember where he left his glasses. They're on his face, of course, and I love those white mutton chops. He's sporting a simple button-up shirt with bow tie, a black belt with buckle, and a pair of brown suspenders, which keep his green pants where they belong. And if we spin him around, you'll see this awesome backpack. It looks a little out of scale, but that's because it's fully functional. You're able to open this up and store all sorts of small items inside, such as this revolver. You also have a bar holder on each side, which can be used for items like this pickaxe and skillet. But if there's one accessory that Dr. Lightning is synonymous with, it's his trusty magnifying glass. And yes, it really does work. And it's perfect for poring over old maps and relics. The Good Doctor is an integral part of the team and a classic minifigure, but I've saved my favorite of this set for last. Harry Kane, the adventurer's go-to pilot. There was only one version of this character throughout all of the adventurer's sub-themes, but I think that's because LEGO realized that they'd really hit the mark on the first try. I love everything about this character, from his flight cap and goggles, to his sweet fleece-lined bomber jacket, but his face print is what puts him over the top for me. 
you can just tell that he's a wisecracking, devil-may-care personality, and that if you named any city on Earth, he could probably tell you where to find the best bar. It's probably not what his designers had in mind, but that's how he's always struck me. And if you haven't noticed a trend of facial hair in this series, you haven't been paying attention, although Harry's is a bit more rugged and unkempt, which suits him. Apart from Johnny Thunder, he's the guy I'd want backing me up in a fight. And speaking of Johnny, he's nowhere to be found here, surprisingly. But don't worry, he'll be back in our next episode. And now, let's get back to the meat and potatoes of this set. We'll start with this small campsite. It's pretty simple, built up on a 4x6 tan plate, with this small campfire and a palm tree, which provides our heroes a much needed reprieve from the midday sun. A few inquisitive scorpions round out the scene. Moving on from there, we've got a little something for Doc to examine in the form of this beautifully decorated sarcophagus. This was cutting edge printing for LEGO back in 1998, and it still holds up today. I love the metallic gold accents contrasting with the red and blue ink. And if we crack it open, an old friend of Pharaoh Hotep perhaps? A standard old style floppy arm skeleton with no additional accessories. But our two villains must think there's something pretty important inside because they've come armed to the teeth to steal it away from Doc and Harry. This is a fantastic little buggy, and again, I love that two figures are able to sit side by side in this specialized body element. The build is pretty similar to the Scorpion Tracker, but it's a bit more full featured. Just behind this grill piece, poking out of the engine bay, is this souped up power plant complete with red block, light gray cylinder heads, black valve covers, and my favorite, open headers. They definitely aren't going to be sneaking up on anyone in this thing. The windshield is also a little different, sporting a very nice print depicting road grime and what I assume is a bullet hole. You've got a sextant clipped here on the driver's side, which is a very cool accessory, but I think the defining feature of the vehicle is this two rifle gun rack mounted on the passenger side. It can be swiveled around a bit for precise aiming, but <laughs> just don't point it in this direction. The rear features the same cargo setup we saw in the Scorpion Tracker, complete with some digging tools. And another commonality with Johnny Thunder's car is this included treasure map, which is the same one we saw in episode 2. Overall, this is an excellent addition to our ever-growing stable of adventurers' vehicles. But not quite as excellent as the last thing on our checklist. I mentioned in the previous episode that this set contained my favorite plane of the desert theme, and here she is. I really like the tan and white color combination designated to this build, and this being one of the few desert sets that actually comes with stickers, they're all used here and to great effect. Let's start from the rear this time. The single piece tail fin sports a nice sticker with a patch and a strafe pattern of bullet holes. And just ahead on the fuselage, we'll find another stickered tile with a patch design. These decals feature simple details, but they add so much to the plane's character, I think. And beneath the tail is this Technic pin in lieu of a rear wheel. The cockpit is a definite step up from the Bywing Baron, featuring not one, but two control sticks. I'm pretty sure these are meant to represent a gun sight. And I'm still not a fan of these hollow studs, but that's an easy fix with a few 1x2 tiles. The only other thing I wish this plane included was a second seat, so Doc wouldn't have to walk across the desert on foot. Just above the cockpit is an old school movie camera for capturing Harry's high-flying escapades. Although if we take a closer look at the printed tile stored inside, we'll see that it depicts a photo of Johnny Thunder and Doc at the entrance of a tomb. This print is identical in all of the desert sets. The wings are pretty standard, featuring some green accents in the form of 2x2 round tiles, and they're supported by four black window elements, which work well and look great. Beneath the top wing, there's a pair of rifles mounted on either side of the body. But everything I love about this plane is right here. These stickered hinge panels really set the entire build off, with their excellent shark face nose art design, but it gets better. This feature was something I didn't even know existed until I actually built the set. These panels are able to be opened up to reveal 
an inline three-cylinder engine. This is just a fantastic detail. Most of the time LEGO would just design the whole front end out of solid bricks, but they decided to go the extra mile here and add a very cool play feature, with Harry now able to get into the engine compartment and make some much needed repairs after sustaining battle damage. And at the very front is this large wooden prop. I think I like this design better than the three bladed one we saw on Baron's biplane. And just when you thought the fun was about to end, we're going to take a look below the fuselage, where we'll see the landing gear, which would be pretty uninteresting if it weren't for this little slot right here. And that's designed with a very specific purpose in mind, hauling cargo. This supply crate is the last thing included in the set, and it's built with this tile hanging over the edge, which slides right in here. The weight of the box keeps it in place pretty well until you're ready to drop your cargo, in which case you simply tilt the plane forward. On top of the crate is this printed dynamite tile. This was the only Lego dynamite we had back then, long before the modern fully molded element came around. Inside the crate, you'll find all sorts of provided accessories, like a pair of black binoculars, a revolver, and yet another treasure map. This is the third different map we've seen so far, and it's marked with the number 80 in the bottom corner and features another new face at the top. And the red X is moved a little further north. I love that LEGO decided to give us four different maps to collect, and we still have one more to check out in an upcoming episode, so stay tuned for that. At the end of the day, this is one of my favorite sets from the theme, and for good reason. The possibilities are endless as far as play goes, and everything included is going to look great on your display shelf. The only downside is that this set is a little less common than some of the others in the Adventurers line, so it's going to be a bit more expensive than you would expect. I picked this one up used on eBay for about $50, but if you're patient you could probably find it a little cheaper. I really wanted this one, so I didn't mind paying for it, and I haven't suffered a bit of buyer's remorse yet, so it's a definite recommend for me. But, if you're looking for something that's still very cool but a little bit more affordable, keep an eye out for our next installment in the Adventures Retrospective, Episode 5, The Desert Oasis. Be sure to click that subscribe button because we have a lot more desert sets to take a look at in the future. So once again, this has been Jamie for Trick Bricks. Thanks for watching, and until next time, take care everybody, and play well!